and read from Psalm 102. While you are still standing, we will read from verse 1 to 22. And then you can sit. Psalm 102. From verse 1 to 22. Let's declare it together. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me. In the day when I incline thine ear unto me, in the day when I call, answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the house top. My enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread, and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute, and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people shall be created, shall praise the Lord. For he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From the heaven did the Lord behold the earth. To hear the groaning of the prisoner. To loose those that are appointed to death. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion. And his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together. And the kingdoms to serve the Lord. Now, before you sit, let's emphasize verse 13 together. Let's declare it with a loud voice because this is what the Lord is set to do in the coming year. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. Amen. Father, we just like to acknowledge all that you have done since the beginning of this meeting. We return all the glory to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, the few minutes I want to speak, I just like to speak like a saint one that you will pass through me and bring your counsel to this house and beyond this house to the nation and beyond our nation to the nations. As I speak, I'm speaking to people, but I'm also speaking to the land in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm speaking to the nations in your name. Therefore, constrain me by your spirit to be accurate in delivery, to say only the things that you want to say now, and just pass as a vehicle for you. I ask, Lord, that you authorize the angels over this nation to be sensitive at this time, that our prayers, our offerings from this altar will energize them, to do some things at the four quarters of our nation that require urgent attention now. Father, we just praise your name. We bless your name. We worship you. 
and we thank you for utterance. Thank you for empowering us by your spirit. And Holy Spirit, we make room for you to operate in us and among us the way you have never done before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Now, I'm going to be talking about the end times because this is what the pastor asked me to speak about. And I will just be saying four things. It's a vast subject. We can talk about it for weeks. But we don't have the weeks. We all want to go home <laughs> and do the crossover. So the Lord will help us to say the essential things in Jesus' name. So when you're talking about end times or the end of the age, basically, you are talking about the biblical concept of time. Because whenever you say something has to end, then that thing is within the boundary of time. It has a beginning and it has an end. And if you look at the scripture, time has two major dimensions, the way it is revealed and outlined in scripture. We have chronos time that has to do with the calendar that has definition. It has a beginning, it has an end. I give you an example. Every day has 24 hours. It doesn't have more. Then every year has 365 days. It doesn't have more. And then every week has seven days. It doesn't have more. It begins, it ends, it's precise. You can predict it, you can determine that this is when it will come, this is when it will go. That is chronos time. Then also, the Bible talks about kairos time, which is time that is outside the boundary of time, which is something that is not definite, something you cannot predict. You know, something that happens because of the eternal dimensions of God. You know, when we talk about eternity, some people look at it that it's maybe a long period of time. It's not. It's actually a mode of existence that is found in God, or the God mode of existence. God is not subject to time. God actually created time from himself. Time exists within the heart of Christ. Time is actually a dimension, an aspect, a strap that God took from Christ in order to do some things within human history. Now, it's important we understand this because if we do, we can then understand the scripture that we just read. That when God's time comes, nothing can stop it. Let me give you one example of Kairos time in scripture. If we open the book of Exodus chapter 3, we know the story. I'm not going to be reading much of it, but it's good we open it. Moses was in the backside of the desert at a time in his life when God was preparing him for his ministry. And then he came to a place and saw a bush burning, and that bush was not being consumed. Let's go to verse 2. The angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, or Jehovah, appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Verse 3. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great side, why the bush is not burnt. Now, that bush was burning. It was not being consumed because it needs time to burn. If you bring light, maybe match or petrol or anything and ignite a fire, if you can stop time, it will not consume. Even if you bring all the wood in this world. So that moment was a moment when eternity interlaced with time when God entered the boundaries of time to do some things. Now, when that time comes, 
it is outside the concept of time. It's important we understand this because of what I will say towards the end. You remember when Daddy Wampa was teaching us about the heavens, he said something, that the power of the occult is actually that they appeal to the heavens. Heavens, sun, moon, stars. That is the strength of the occult. Let me show you one scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 from verse 1 to 10. Everything that has to do with oppression, everything that has to do with demonization, witchcraft, occultism, the highest degree of the occult happens on that time. So if God can have a people that will rise outside the boundaries of sun and ascend beyond the stars and the sun, as he wants to do in the last day, that is actually the power that will defeat occultism. So I return, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1, and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. Oppressions, demonizations, affliction, occultism, satanism, evil, witchcraft, the highest degree of the occult. All of them happen under the sun, empowered by the sun and the heavenly bodies. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressors, there was power, but they had no comfort. But I come to announce this morning that the situation has changed. Yeah. We now have a comfort. We now have a comforter. I don't know if you understand what I said. So that is the definition of time. Now, let me introduce another concept. You know that the eighth day in Bible numerology has to do with new beginning. Do you know why it's the symbol of the new beginning? It is because it is that time that God brings eternity into time. The resurrection day, the day Christ rose from the day dead was an eighth day. Now that eighth day are windows when God chooses to walk outside boundary of time to establish his purpose. When that time comes, there is no answer from Satan or occult or occultism or anything that is created. Now, I came here with a prayer burden. I'm going to be praying as I share because I have a limited time. I will also be prophesying. I will also be teaching. Now, the eighth day are days that are rare. One example when God brought the eighth day in scripture is mentioned in the book of Esther. Esther was a slave girl. Esther was an orphan. The father has died, the mother has died. He didn't, she didn't have help, she didn't have power. She didn't have connection. And then she found herself in the house of her cousin, Mordecai, who was also like her uncle, who was raising her in a strange land. And in that strange land, strong persecution came against her race to wipe her out. Because of time, let's see two verses from Esther. Esther chapter 2, verse 15. Let me tell you what happened on the eighth day. On the eighth day, eternity comes into time. On those days, anything is possible. So when God says the time to favor you has come, He's saying that he's coming from a dimension that no power can stop. Now, those are the things that Christ died and rose again in order to bequeath to us as a legacy, especially as the end time church. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihai, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for her daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of women, appointed. And Esther obtained what? Favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. Now, all these prophecies you have received since the beginning of this conference are not going to be fulfilled because of your capacity. 90% of them will happen because of the favor of God. Amen. When God's favor comes, Doors that were closed before open of their own accord. 
when God's favor comes, the person that is the last is brought to the front. When God's favor comes, things that has been very difficult becomes very easy. Now, the Lord said that 2020 will be a year of his favor. Now, it will be a year of divine order, divine government, divine establishment, and also divine discipline. God is going to come to establish his order. And because of that, he is going to open some windows beyond the boundaries of time in order to do some things that have been difficult to do. Now, that is the biblical concept of time. So, when we are talking about the end time, we are now talking about the period that God has appointed for human history to work out so that he can come back and claim the shields of the earth. Remember, we've had it during this conference, how God lost the earth temporarily to Satan. And then Christ came in order to pay the price for the recovery of the earth. We have been living at a time when that purpose is being worked out. So all of human history is divided into three segments. From the time of Adam to the time of Abraham, it has elapsed about 2,000 years. From the time of Abraham to the time of Christ, it has elapsed 2,000 years. From the time of Christ to the end of the age, it will also be 2,000 years. Now the controversy is we are not sure where exactly we are in that 2,000 years. Because the calendar of human history has been messed up a, a bit for political and satanic reasons. But if we go by the Gregorian calendar, the 2,000 years elapsed in the millennium, year 2000. If we go by the Hebrew calendar, where are we in the Hebrew calendar? This is year 5779 in the Hebrew calendar. So if you do the mathematics between the two of them, you find the truth. So no matter how you look at it, we do no longer have time. And I'm going to show you some verses from the scripture to establish that. So if we want to talk about what will happen in the end times, the best way to go is actually to go to the word of the Lord. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the person who died, he's the person who came, he's the person who rose from the dead, he's the person that ascended to heaven in the, on the third day, and he is the person that made the promise that he will return again. And so, he is the best bet if we want to really establish what the Bible says about the end time. So let's look at Matthew chapter 24 and read a few verses from there. Matthew chapter 24, I actually recommend that we read this scripture prayerfully because we are even going to glean some things that are supposed to be our assignment. God is saying to man that we no longer have time. We cannot afford to be here and there. We have to be precise at this time because we are the generation living at the last terminal end of the age. Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. The next verse. And Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The next verse. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Notice the question they ask, three questions. When shall these things be? That thing you said about the destruction of the temple, when is it going to happen? Then second question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Third question. So the whole discourse you see in Matthew chapter 24, 
that is referred to as the Olivet Discourse, what Jesus did was actually to answer the, these three questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed? We know by fulfillment of prophecy that it has already happened. It happened 40 years after his ascension when a Roman general named Titus led a battalion of the Roman army and destroyed the temple and then scattered the Jews everywhere in the world and more than a million of them were killed. And then he started the third dispersion of the Jews. You know, the Bible mentions that Jews will be deported from the promised land because of idolatry on three occasions before history ends. The first one, God spoke to Abraham, his friend, in Genesis 15, that in the fourth generation, your children will come back when they have gone into captivity and lived there for 400 years. Did it happen in history? Yes. The Jews were deported to Egypt, and then they came back at a certain time in history. The second deportation, Jeremiah prophesied about it, Jeremiah chapter 25, when he said because of idolatry, Jews will go into captivity to Babylon and different nations, and that they will stay in that captivity for 70 years. Was it fulfilled in history? Yes. If you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was studying that prophecy. When realization came upon him, that the time God prophesied has elapsed and they were still in captivity. So Daniel began to pray, began to fast, began to offer repentance, began to mourn and to remind God, this prophecy has elapsed and we are still in captivity. So I also come to prophesy that everything that has held you in captivity beyond the boundary that God has allowed, because it is the time of his favor, we declare from this altar that you will not go into, with that captivity into the next year. Yeah. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. every first labor ends this year, yeah. especially for the people who love the Lord. Yeah. Now, the third captivity is what the Lord was saying that they will still go into captivity, the temple will be destroyed, and it was exactly fulfilled. So, that is what he answered. Then the next question, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, if you read the whole of Matthew, he mentions a lot of them, but let me just summarize it for you. What he said can actually be brought down into four major things that will be the complexion of the end of the age. Number one, there will be increase in iniquity. Number two, lawlessness will abound everywhere. Number three, the self-life will increase even among the people who say they belong to God. And number four, men will attempt to be independent and they will do all kinds of things. I'm going to just make a few comments around these four areas. Because if you read everything from Matthew chapter 24, it comes under these four headings. And then at the later verses, he now begins to say that there will be sign in the heavenly bodies when the time for his return gets very near. Now, iniquity is actually the subject we have been dealing with since the beginning of this conference. Iniquity is strong because iniquity did not originate on earth. Iniquity actually started in heaven. We know the story, God created some powerful angels and they lived with him in the timeless past in heaven. At that time, the earth was created, but the earth was not inhabited by man. And some of these angels, God gave them governmental authority over the universe, including the earth. And one of these angels happens to be Lucifer. If you read Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 29, and Job, especially chapter 7, 8, 32, you will see all these things revealed in scripture. And then Lucifer had assignments because God 
is God that is worshipped. And he's worshipped to be worshipped because he is the creator of the universe. So a lot of worship goes on in heaven. And then God created Lucifer so beautifully and then gave him the privilege to be the angel at the eastern gate of the altar to lead worship. Because even in heaven, there are places where God steps down from his throne to come and meet with his sons. Read Job chapter 1. You know there was a gathering of the council in heaven in Job's days. If you read Job chapter 1, it says there was a day when the sons of God, those are angels, gathered to worship God, and then Satan also, because that time he has been cast out of heaven, came also. So there are times like that. So Lucifer's assignment was to be like the choir master. When God was coming into his temple, he is the one that will sound, arise, the king of kings approaches. Worship the one who is worthy to be worshipped. Worship Jehovah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Worship Jehovah, worship Yahweh, the possessor of the heavens and the earth. Now, because of this assignment, God created Satan with a lot of honor. He beautified him, gave him a beautiful voice. He didn't require musical instrument to make music. That's what the Bible says. That every of your, your dressing, the things God created him with, were musical instrument. His voice could make music. He could make music with his palm. And then after some time, he began to say, why am I doing all the work? Monkey the work, bamboo the shop. Is it not what we say? Why am I directing all this worship to a bee? And then the Bible says from that time, he began to harbor that thought. Iniquity was found in him. So iniquity is a state of the heart. When you begin to accommodate thought lines that are contra thought lines without repenting, eventually you will act it out. So that is what happened to Lucifer. Because if you read Isaiah chapter 14, at a time he began to express it, that I want to be like the Almighty God. I will ascend to the northernmost parts of his throne. I will be like the Almighty. And then he began to plot a coup. And if you want to plot coup, you must mobilize support. And the easiest way to mobilize support is character assassination. He began to say, look at this man. If I was the king, look at all the work you are doing. If I'm the one, you will have more honor. And as he continues to do that, Bible did not tell us how long. God is all-knowing. God knew the time he started that coup, but God did nothing. I come to prophesy to us, there are things you are doing today that are evil. God is aware of them. If you are in the house of God and you are not being faithful, you are stealing, you are stand, slandering your leaders, you are sabotaging, you are doing some things that you ought not to do. God is, not, God is aware. The fact that he has not spoken doesn't mean that he is not aware. God is long-suffering. God is not like man. There is nothing you can do that can disorganize him forever. You can set him back, but you cannot defeat his counsel. God lives outside time, but he will give you time sometimes to aspire. You know, that is why sometimes it looks as if the wicked are so powerful. There is nobody God created that is more powerful than God. And we have examples in history. Where is Pharaoh? Where is Hitler? Where is Stalin? And then coming this way, where are some of our generals that held this nation for, to ransom? A day came when they expired. God is still there doing his work. So that is the nature of God. You can't defeat him. So learn from history and submit to him. Then a day came when iniquity was full. Because God will wait for iniquity to be full. Read Genesis chapter 15. God told Abraham, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. When iniquity comes, God's anger is provoked. And then he intervenes. 
I don't know if I have time to say this. When is it that iniquity is full? Iniquity becomes full when people in authority begin to make it an ordinance. Let's look at one scripture. Leviticus chapter 18. Maybe I'll read just one verse. Verse 2 and 3. Leviticus chapter 18. Please, let's go there speak quickly. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Verse 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. What were the ordinances? He now listed it from chapter 5. All manner of evil. Incest, murder, having sexual relations with children, all kind of things that we are dealing with today. You know, men are no longer <laughs> looking for women. Men are looking for men. Women are looking for women. Some people have graduated. They no longer want to have sexual relations with human beings. They are descending to animals. And they are forcing and using government power to legalize it. That is when iniquity comes to the full. That is when men make iniquity an ordinance. Now, it's important for us to understand that God has not given to any person in authority the authority to determine the eternal destiny of another person. So when you make it a law that iniquity, you are sending people to hell outside their conscience. Somebody says, I know this is the word of God. I don't want to do this. You say you, he must do it. Can I prophesy to you? Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. God is our lawgiver. God is our king. God is our judge. And Father, I stand in this altar to declare, be our lawgiver. Be our king. Be our judge. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, because you are the one who created Nigeria, constrain those men we sent to the National Assembly to do the right thing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And may I prophesy also, if they will not do the right thing, God will show them the right way. Amen. In his own way. Amen. But when God wants to show you, go and ask Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar how it looks. But we're opening a gate of repentance. May they repent Amen. in Jesus' name. So that is about iniquity. Lawlessness, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. I just want to emphasize that lawlessness is actually a spirit. We are living at the time of lawlessness. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. So the person that engineers lawlessness is a man. The Bible talks about the Antichrist in three dimensions. Spirit of Antichrist, many Antichrists, the Antichrist. Now the spirit of Antichrist has been in the earth and it has been increasing progressively. Bringing us to this time when it's becoming difficult even for men who are supposed to be righteous, to know the difference between right and wrong. That is the spirit of lawlessness. Then D, many antichrists, talking about the many, many wicked men that are released in their numbers in this generation. Because one way Satan is recruiting his end time army is actually to increase lawlessness and men of lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Lawlessness is the violation of divine order. God has an order. God is God of order. God is God of order. God is God of government. God can forgive you anything, but God will deal with you when you violate his order. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
let's look at it and see God's order. I will just make one or two comments because of time. First Corinthians chapter 11, so that we can profit from all these blessings that has been released upon us. Now Paul is writing, be followers of mine, even as I also am a follower of Christ. He says, now I praise you, brethren, that he remember me in all things and keep the ordinances I delivered. Now notice the word ordinances, as I delivered to you. Ordinance is from order. You know, keep the orders I delivered to you. And then in the next verse, he begins to tell us God's order. But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Now, that is what Paul wants to say in this scripture. God's order. Paul is a lawyer and a Jewish poet. And the way they write their poetry, they make the point, and then they use many examples to establish that point. So everything he wrote about the necessity for women covering their hair is just to use some common examples to establish that there is divine order. And what is that divine order? God, number one. Christ, man, and woman. And then God says, observe this order in the family. Observe this order in the church. Observe this order in society so that there will not be lawlessness. And then Christ gave us the example in establishing the governmental offices in the church, all the designated offices, he made sure they were men. So, if you come to the family, and then, and divine order doesn't mean that there is inequality. It's just that it is the order of God. Because if you even look at it, women, it has been proven, are stronger than men. They have more capacity to endure. That is the truth. If you look at the, you know, life expectancy of every nation, women live longer. Women can bear labor pains. The most powerful institution on earth is the church. And the church is pictured as a man. The church is pictured as a woman, the bride of Christ. So that tells you that women are actually the powerhouse of God. <laughs> 